Good afternoon. Uh, I want to invite those in the back. Go ahead and come on up. There's some space up here in the front. I think even more folks are, are going to be coming. Thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, I'm Philip Munoz. I direct the TOCO program and the Constitutional Studies program. Uh, and it's my pleasure you, uh, to welcome you to our first event of the semester. Uh, what, a, what a crowd. This is great. Um, just a couple of announcements and thank you uh, before we introduce our speakers. Uh, for you undergraduates, um, I'm sure many of you know, but in case you don't, we have a Constitutional Studies minor, and uh, we have information on the minor in the back. Uh, so if you're interested in questions of law and justice, things we're going to be talking about today, please uh, uh, come find out about the, the minor. We also have just published our uh, schedule of, of events for the fall. I think we have these on the back and they're on the, on the web. Just a couple of things to highlight for you. Um, uh, next month, we have one of the nation's leading political scientists, uh, Jeffrey Toulis, who will be here. Uh, he's well worth seeing. Uh, we have two uh, faculty book events this semester, which I'm excited about. Dan Philpot, professor of political science, is about to publish a book on religious freedom in Islam. We're planning an event uh, on his book in March. And then Father Miss Campbell is about to publish his long-awaited biography of Father Hesburgh. Uh, and um, first public announcement of this, that uh, we'll have an evening event with Father Miss Campbell and a few commentators. That's going to be on April 16th. Uh, information on those events and others, please see uh, uh, our website. One of the things, one of my favorite parts of the program uh, is uh, the staff I work with, uh, Jen Smith and uh, uh, Sarah Joyce. I don't see them. They're probably running around in the back. They make all this possible. Uh, especially the food, so uh, please join me in thanking them and my staff for <laughs> One of the other privileges of running the program is working with uh, our students, especially our undergraduate fellows. We have a group of fellows who uh, meet with our visitors, uh, they help us plan our events, they introduce our speakers. Uh, last night they uh, uh, had um, uh, beverages with uh, Professor Yu. Um, Alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. Uh, <laughs> uh, our, I'm told our longest serving fellow, uh, also constitutional studies minor, uh, Isabella Panola, will um, uh, introduce our speakers. Uh, she's a senior, and I think it's also true she's the constitutional studies fellow, um, constitutional studies student who has dropped more of my classes than any other <laughs> student today. <laughs> So Isabella uh, will introduce our speakers. Let me just add one uh, note on the format. Uh, we're doing this in a Lincoln-Douglas du Lincoln style uh, debate. So uh, Professor Desch will speak first. We'll speak for 20, 15 minutes. Uh, Professor Yu will have 20 minutes. And then we'll let uh, Professor Desch have five more minutes. Strict time limits, uh, fellows. And uh, then we'll open it up for a conversation among the panelists and uh, with the audience. So Isabella. Thank you so much for joining us for today's debate. Is promoting democracy abroad bad for maintaining democracy at home? It is my pleasure to introduce our two speakers, Professor Michael Desch and Professor John Yu. <coughs> professor Michael Desch is a Packy JD Professor of International Relations here at Notre Dame, and he is the founding director of the Notre Dame International Security Center. His experience in international relations and international security has a rich and long history. Professor Desch has worked for a U.S. Senator, for the State Department, and in the Foreign Affairs and National Defense Division of the Congressional Research Service. A prolific scholar, he has authored, co-authored, and edited numerous works, the most recent of which is his just published 2019 book, Cults of the Irrelevant, The Waning Influence of Social Science on National Security. Professor John Yu is the Emmanuel Heller Professor of Law and Director of the Korea Law Center at the University of California, Berkeley. From 2001 to 2003, he served as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice. During his two years working for the Bush administration, his bold stances on foreign affairs, war powers, and the separation of powers made him one of the more controversial figures in recent American politics. Professor Yu writes regularly for the Los Angeles Times and the National Review, and he is the author or editor of nine books, including, most recently, the co-authored Striking Power, How Cyber Robots and Space Weapons Change the Rules for War. Please join me in welcoming Professor Stash and you. Uh, 
uh, I'm glad to be here and uh, thrilled to uh, be co-sponsoring something with uh, my good friend and colleague uh, Philip Munoz and the Con Studies program. Uh, Philip grabbed the high ground and said that they're all about justice, so I guess that means NDISC is all about injustice. Uh, but of course, uh, we'll see over the course of the, uh, the debate uh, whether the superficial actually reflects the deeper reality. Uh, this is a Lincoln-Douglas style debate. I'm taller than Professor Yu, so I get to be uh, Lincoln. I won uh, the election. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, the uh, resolution out there uh, is promoting democracy abroad is bad for maintaining uh, democracy at home. And I'm speaking in the affirmative, although I want to mention a caveat to the affirmative. Uh, my opposition to spreading democracy abroad is not in principle, but rather it's an objection to the way the United States has done it since the end of the Cold War. Uh, basically through uh, deep engagement with countries around the world to socially engineer them into becoming uh, democracies. And it's been the use of military force uh, behind the uh, United States democracy uh, agenda that's been, in my view, particularly problematic. And I'm going to talk uh, more about that in the course of my remarks. Now, I'm not, all not at all opposed uh, to the spread of democracy globally. Um, and I consider myself a partisan of an exemplarist uh, view uh, of the role of the United States in this process. John Winthrop, the Puritan leader who was plagiarized by President Reagan, talked about the United States as a shining city on the hill. Um, and uh, that's my view uh, of the role the United States should take in promoting uh, democracy abroad. Whoops. Sorry, up. Sorry Mr. Mike, President. Mike. <laughs> now, my thinking on this question, not only in the context of today's debate, but uh, in general, has been indelibly stamped by a tragedy that I'm teaching this semester. Let me describe this tragic situation. A democracy, uh, in fact, the font of what we in the West regard as much of the best of our political and uh, philosophical tradition, played a key role in defeating a major military challenge from an Eastern autocracy. Uh, and in the process, inherited an empire and a dominant place uh, in the world of its time. Now this great democracy tried to remake its empire and indeed all of the known world uh, at the time in its own democratic interest. But in doing so, it ignored the fear that its power engendered uh, among many of the other states uh, in the international system and was blinded to this fact by its own belief that it was exceptional, indeed indispensable to the international system. Now, a major war resulted, and this war caused an enormous loss of life for the democracy and its rivals. It involved a traditional interstate war, which was pretty bad, but it was combined with an absolutely brutal series of civil wars um, that really stretched uh, the bounds of uh, barbarity. Um, and in fact, these wars undermined the democratic political system of this democratic great power. And in fact, this democratic great power went on to uh, lose the war. Now, of course, the students in my freshman seminar on the, on the greatest war story ever told uh, recognize this uh, as the Cliff Notes version of Thucydides' famous uh, account of the rise and fall of democratic Athens in the Peloponnesian War uh, between 431 um, and 404 BC. But I'm sure you can understand how I hear echoes in the sad fate uh, of democratic Athens uh, in the modern situation uh, confronting the United States. And like the founding fathers who read Thucydides in Greek, which I didn't do, 
uh, they understood that uh, the fate of Periclean Athens was a cautionary tale uh, for the young republic. And I think it remains a cautionary tale for us today. So I want to make two arguments in the next 45 minutes. And then Professor Yu gets five minutes to respond and go to uh, Q&A. That's all the time I'll need. <laughs> Hubris is a classically <laughs> tragic uh, failure. Um, and we feel sympathy for the hubristic, um, but we also know that their faith is inexorable. Uh, and, uh, so you'll be smoked down. The key question is before it ha if it happens before your uh, four and a half minutes of so coming from my efforts to respond to you. So I'm going to make two points. Uh, America's efforts to spread democracy abroad, particularly at the point of a gun, have largely failed. Okay? There have been a handful of successes, uh, Germany and Japan after World War II, but actually these handful of successes are the exceptions that prove the rule. Moreover, in the process of fighting perpetual wars for perpetual peace, we have seriously damaged our own liberty at home. So I'm going to make those uh, two points here. Now, why efforts to promote democracy abroad are likely to fail, and why the United States has uh, failed over the past quarter of a century? Uh, first of all, if you just look at the track record um, and you take a capacious, indeed small c Catholic, uh, view of a success, uh, since 1815, uh, the best case you can make is that uh, occupations to nation build have been successful less than 30% of the time. And indeed, if you sort of dig down, you say, what have been those successful cases? Uh, they're almost all invariably uh, European states. Which takes us to the cases of post-World War II, Germany and Japan which are the favorite cases for the proponents of an activist American foreign policy uh, to spread democracy. And again, you look at them uh, in a little bit of detail, and it becomes clear how sui generis uh, they are. These were cases of countries totally defeated in major war. Um, in the aftermath of, of that war, they all faced a common threat, in this case, uh, from the Soviet Union. So they were happy to have the United States hang around for a long period of time and also inclined to uh, do the United States bidding. But finally, and most importantly, Germany and Japan had a tradition uh, of democracy prior to uh, uh, Imperial Japan or the Nazi Third Reich. And this is very important because democracy, we know, requires certain preconditions. And if you have these preconditions, it's highly likely that you'll be a democratic state. If you don't have them, uh, all the occupation in the world uh, can't impose it. Secondly, the most important ism in contemporary international relations is nationalism. We've sort of forgotten that in the uh, uh, period, uh, especially since the end of the Cold War, when Frank Fukuyama told us uh, that we had reached the end of history. Um, but we know, uh, in fact, and it's coming back with a vengeance, that most countries are animated primarily by nationalism. Uh, and nationalism is incompatible with efforts by outside powers to uh, socially engineer other countries. So let's talk about a couple of examples uh, of how American efforts to spread democracy uh, have gone a cropper. Uh, and NATO expansion for me um, is exhibit A. Um, NATO was expanded for a variety of reasons, but the consolidation of democracy in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union was one of the top rationales. Now, in 1995, I was in Moscow. It was actually with Sam Huntington, who was a teacher of Professor Hughes at Harvard. And Huntington was very close to Tony Lake, who was Bill Clinton's 
national security advisor. And uh, the Russian foreign minister at the time, Andrei Kozirev, uh, who worked for Boris, Boris Yeltsin and was one of the leading Democrats um, in Russia, called Sam in for a meeting. Uh, after a talk that he'd given, and I was horse holder, so I got to uh, go along. And he c tried to convey to Sam uh, a message. He said, if you care about the fate of Russian democracy, the last thing that you will ever do is expand NATO. Uh, this will kill democracy in Russia. Now, democracy is dead in Russia. Did NATO expansion kill it? Well, a number of things probably killed it. Um, but NATO expansion was probably a big part of that. Remember, the first round of NATO expansion takes place in 1999. What's the year that Vladimir Putin uh, became part of the Russian government? One year later, 2000. Okay. Um, secondly, expansion of uh, NATO has not ensured democracy uh, in the new democratic states. I think you could just basically say Viktor Orban and shut up shop uh, and make that point, although there are a lot of other uh, new democracies uh, uh, in which democracy is not uh, well ensconced. Indeed, democracy is not doing well in Europe um, in general. Um, so the bottom line is, is that uh, the period of the last quarter century, when we were pushing the democracy promotion effort, uh, has been largely ineffective. In fact, Freedom House notes that uh, 113 countries uh, in recent years have experienced a net decline um, in their uh, uh, level uh, of democracy. Um, and so the time the United States has bestrode the world um, as the democratic colossus has also been a time in which democracy uh, has basically been uh, uh, declining uh, in a big way. So why have recent efforts uh, to spread democracy not only failed abroad, um, but also uh, undermined our own liberty uh, here at home? Uh, first of all, uh, war is the engine of big government and the imperial presidency. Uh, if you don't like the big administrative state uh, in the United States, which isn't as big as other countries, but still much bigger than a lot of conservatives uh, would prefer, don't just blame the New Deal. Blame World War I and the Cold War, and ba blame especially um, the war on uh, terror. And indeed, on certain issues, particularly individual privacy, and I know this isn't going to resonate with most of the undergraduates who live every intimate detail of their life uh, in the public space, but those older folks like me who have some shame uh, like a little bit of privacy. You have no privacy today, and thank the USA Patriot Act for that. Indeed, war undermines liberty by making permanent what the German legal theorist Carl Schmitt called the state of the exception from normal constitutional uh, practices. Now, I don't want to deny that sometimes, in desperate times, desperate measures uh, are called for. But we've been living in desperation uh, basically since uh, October uh, of 2001. Um, and uh, I don't see any end uh, of that in sight. Third point. The spread of democracy, particularly through nation building and occupation, puts us in the realm of what uh, Rudyard Kipling called the savage wars of peace. Uh, and I want to emphasize the savage piece of it. Um, and you get involved in any war, and you're going to face moral compromises. But counterinsurgency and nation building uh, are especially brutal. When you try to remake a country, you create winners and losers. The losers are going to fight back. Uh, and insurgency and terrorism uh, is often going to be their response. And our response is we get dragged down uh, to their level. Uh, we fight those sorts of wars as dirty wars. And we resort uh, to war crimes and torture and other things that ultimately uh, don't help the cause, as the French learned in Algeria 
1961, but actually uh, make things worse for us in the, uh, uh, in, for global uh, public opinion. Now, a recent American innovation uh, in fighting wars, and th this I have to confess uh, ambivalent feelings to, because on the one hand, and I'm almost done, John. Uh, on the one hand, uh, I, I have to appreciate its cleverness uh, because basically what it's doing is sticking my kids uh, with the bill uh, of the profligacy of my generation. Um, but on the other hand, you've got to ask yourself, if you're a fiscal conservative, why in God's name would you support uh, putting wars uh, basically on the nation's credit card um, as uh, rather than raise taxes or uh, mobilize uh, the economy. We're basically saddling future generations not only with uh, fiscal debt, that was probably unnecessary, but also a, uh, a, a, the burden uh, of taking care of veterans uh, from our wars that's going to last uh, a long time. And so with that, uh, I will stop and turn it over to my colleague. Do you clap? Yes. <laughs> From my observation of Notre Dame football games, there's an enormous bias for the home team. So I expect you to clap much more, whereas at Berkeley, you know, football is a charming hobby. Actually, it's also a tradition of being nice to people who come in who are going to get whooped. We don't want to rub it in. Yeah, I saw that in the college football playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I want to make sure you're all against me before I say it. So I would say it's my great pleasure uh, to join you today. Um, and I think it's a wonderful thing that you have here, uh, both the program of constitutional studies and national security studies. We actually at Berkeley don't have programs in either, uh, which may tell you it's more about Berkeley actually than Notre Dame. But I really envy that you have events like this and a debate like this. Um, and so, and I, I really uh, want to show how desirous I was to come out here to debate a distinguished scholar like Professor Desch because I uh, suffered through not just three and a half hour layover at O'Hare, but a drop of 30 degrees in my ambient temperature <laughs> leaving California and joining you here. Um, but it's always a pleasure to leave the uh, People's Republic of Berkeley and come to more conservative places like South Bend, Indiana. <laughs> and this is one of the few times I have the pleasure of debating someone I feel is more conservative than I am. This, does not, this never happens to me, actually, in the entire state of California. <laughs> so thank you for giving me that opportunity. So I'm going to make three basic points. Uh, and I just want to say also, uh, just as before I pause, I, I, am a great, I am a great admirer of Professor Desch's work. And he doesn't know it, but I actually have relied on uh, his uh, work, which is much better than this lecture in other <laughs> subjects uh, on civil military relations, in fact. And, and we've been at conferences together about Thucydides, which I actually, as a child, was made to read in Greek because I'm Asian and I wanted to get into college. So, <laughs> I actually have read Thucydides in Greek. So I'm going to make three points. Uh, I, on one area we agree with, which is the dynamic of war and civil liberties. The second point about war and uh, are wars for democracy, have they been failures or not? Which actually doesn't really require you to answer yes or no for purposes of this debate, because the debate is really about the third topic was, has it harmed our civil liberties? And that's where I'll degree, disagree the most, I think, with uh, Professor Desch. So first, I completely agree with him about our worries about the dynamic that's created by war. It's not just wars for democracy, but just war generally. War generally. Uh, transfers under our Constitution power to the president. And it creates a centralization of authority uh, because the framers of our Constitution thought that if you have a war or an emergency, you don't know what's going to happen. Legislatures can't manage them, pass laws in advance. You have to give that power to the institution of our government that's in being and that's designed to be fast, secret, and act with Right? Dispatch. That's what uh, Alexander Hamilton said in the Federalist Papers, describing, defending why the presidency is uh, one person. Right? So the idea was the president would be in charge of the armed forces, manage the wars. And back then, think about it, our primary function of our armed forces was to defend the border. Right? Don't tell Trump that. <laughs> it was to defend the border. All these adventures, I agree, that we've engaged in since then. Uh, you know, those were maybe some of the founders, something like Hamilton, uh, hoped that would happen someday. But primarily, they're worried about border security in the beginning and being invaded. 
we were surrounded by uh, rival, hostile European powers uh, at the time. So uh, as part of that, we uh, worry that liberties will constrict because we have to do what's necessary to win the war. Founders are worried about it. We've been worried about it in our history ever since. One question is, uh, I, that's, I do not deny that happens in war. The question is, does it last? Do you see civil liberties take a permanent downward trajectory because of war? And I would say no. Actually, I think you could say it doesn't have an effect at all. Because I think Professor Desch's argument has to be, if we hadn't had those wars, our liberties would be so much greater now than they were before. I'm not sure that's the case. In fact, I think if you look at our history, uh, I, I, don't know, uh, I don't think anyone's already figured out why, but we in constitutional law notice huge bursts of individual liberty, at least in formal constitutional law, occurring after our biggest wars. I'm not saying we should go to war just to you know, revolutions and liberty at home, but there is some kind of relationship there, rather than the reverse. According to Professor Desch, every time we fight a war, our civil liberties actually go down. I actually think for some reason it's the opposite. So, uh, but I do agree with the dynamic and the worry. So the first question he started out is, do we have too many wars for democracy? You'll notice he started uh, pretty much at uh, the post-Cold War, uh, right after uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. I would say uh, the United States has been fighting wars for, to spread democracy well before then. You could say, uh, well, that's not a foreign war, but the Civil War. It was a war by the North against the South to end slavery. In fact, if you want to look at the, probably the greatest systematic deprivation of civil liberties in wartime, it was probably during the Civil War when President Lincoln suspended the right of habeas corpus throughout the country and claimed the uh, executive power to detain anyone he thought was a Confederate sympathizer, which he did in great numbers. Or you could say World War II. What about World War II? Did we uh, go to Germany a fight in Germany, did we fight against Japan for purely national security reasons, or did we also fight to spread democracy? If you're a realist, you know, if you're taking Professor Desch's course on the Peloponnesian War and you're a hardcore Spartan realist who believes in having no fun and having lots of kids to send soldiers to the state to fight in a, a terrible human existence based on the support of thousands of slaves per soldier. Suppose you like that kind of system. <laughs> then a hardcore realist would have said, don't get involved in World War II at all. Right? There's this great book by, I'm sure we've both read this by, a realist who argues the realest thing in World War II to do would have been to let the Germans and Russians just kill each other off, uh, maybe let the Japanese occupy China, and just hoard our strength. Don't get involved in those wars. Right? That might be the true realist position. That might be the true don't fight wars for democracy. Or you could say the Cold War. What about the Cold War? We fought a lot of wars, many of them unfortunately unsuccessful. He didn't mention Vietnam. I thought you were going to talk a lot about Vietnam. Vietnam, uh, we lost, you could say we fought a stalemate in Korea. We fought a lot of little wars all over the world. Panama, Grenada, right? <clears throat> you could say the track record for spreading democracy, I wouldn't say it was uh, less than 30% there, but uh, you know, we didn't have 100% success either, but we were fighting to maintain democracy. And we eventually prevailed. We wore down the Soviet Union. I would count all those Eastern European countries now that they're not perfect democracies, but they're not run by you know, Soviet Union appointed bureaucrats either anymore. They have elections. They have civil liberties of some kind. They're not perfect, but they're democracies. Right? That's all because of those wars we fought during the Cold War and the, 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 the creation of NATO. Perhaps it's mistaken expansion. I don't know. But the defeat of the Soviet Union, I think, is an example of the United States fighting wars for democracy. You know, Professor Desch really focuses, however, on, I think, really Afghanistan and Iraq, right? without talking about them in too much particular. But those are the two, I think, cases that I think his argument is really based on. But I think if you broaden the lens, I think the track record for fighting wars and democracy, for democracy, is much better. Second point I'll just make about that is, again, it's a kind of counterfactual and it's hard to prove, but in all those wars we fought in World War, in World War II and post-World War II, even now, we have lost lives, we have had casualties, 
we have spent uh, blood and treasure. What's the thing that didn't happen in that entire period? There has been no war between the great powers. There has been no war between the major powers. That is the greatest cause of death in human history from combat is when the major powers go to war. In this entire period where, yes, we are fighting a lot of wars, we are accumulating casualties. We don't have any wars between any of the great powers that produces the kind of lives we saw lost in World War II, 20 million. Or World War I, 100 years ago, tens of millions. Right? That did not happen. So maybe we didn't turn every country we wanted to into democracy, but the overall strategy, I think, worked if that strategy is to prevent the kind of lives lost that we've seen in catastrophes. Mostly this is because we stopped the Europeans from fighting each other. We should all agree that the Europeans are the cause of all the world's misfortunes, and they constantly are starting wars, exporting wars, and they have killed tens of millions of each other. And we're the ones who have to constantly go over there you know what, we're like um, Forrest Gump and they're Jenny. We're constantly saving them from themselves, intervening over and over again. Finally, we said, we're putting an end to it. There will be no more wars in Europe. We are making everybody in Europe a democracy. And we did. And we haven't had any more wars. That, I would say, if that had been allowed to happen, we would see far worse deprivations of civil liberties in our country than anything we've had now if we had to fight other great power wars again, like World War I and World War II. But let me, uh, but this is not, I will confess, this is not my area of specialty. I'm willing to defer to Professor Desch and his evaluation of how those wars have gone. Let's talk about civil liberties uh, at home. Did civil liberties really decline because of these wars? I throw out the Civil War, right? After the Civil War, we have the freeing of the slaves. We have the most liberty enhancing aspects of our Constitution, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Most of the rights that you commonly think of as yours are there because of those amendments to the Constitution. Those rights would not be in there if it weren't for the Civil War. We could have had peace in that period before. We'd still have slavery. The war actually produced the kind of liberty that we enjoy today. <clears throat> but suppose a Civil War doesn't count, right? It's too long ago. It's not really a war because it's a Civil War. You know, it's maybe about states' rights and national power, not really about freedom, per se. What about World War II? I, I'd be first to admit that under uh, President Roosevelt, there were deprivations of civil liberties, like the Japanese-American internment camps, like the military trial of Nazi saboteurs. You know, we, there was uh, con uh, extensive surveillance of telephone calls and telegrams during the war. Exactly the kind of things Fresh is talk Professor Desch is talking about. But after the war is over, what happened to civil liberties in our country? We have what's called the Civil Rights Revolution, where we have an enormous burst of liberty in our country. We have the ending of Jim Crow segregation. We have the equalization of rights between men and women. I mean, we, in many ways, we're still living in that period today. Passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act takes place during Vietnam. The act that makes it illegal to discriminate on race and gender and sexual orientation and employment in universities, right, most areas of life, takes place during war, right? Again, I think World War II and those wars afterwards, I'm not saying they caused the civil rights revolution, but they <clears throat> happened at the same time. If Professor Desch were right, none of those all should have passed. We should have fought all those wars. We, in fact, there was a, a person uh, who wrote this famous article at the end of war two, World War II called the Garrison State, and he thought, because, and this was very popular in political science departments in the 40s, the idea that the war against the Soviet Union would be so demanding, there's so much ahead of us in organization, they're willing to sacrifice so much more than us, that we would have to turn ourselves into a military camp to effectively fight them. I would say that guy, who was a brilliant political scientist of his day, but like many political scientists, was completely wrong. Right? Completely wrong. In fact, the opposite happened. We had this great explosion of liberty and rights in our country during wartime, during this long it's called twilight struggle <clears throat> against the Soviet Union, while we are haphazardly trying to spread uh, democracy. Would it have been, what if we had not fought those wars? I'm not saying segregation would have continued, but if you believe that's, 
in the, you know, the wartime produces permanent deprivations, it should be surprising to you that we had the civil rights revolution in the 1960s. Now let me just turn to uh, uh, one last point. He also said uh, it's really uh, three things that have deprived us of civil liberties because of wartime in this more recent modern period. One is the administrative state. The second is kind of the Patriot Act and the state of emergency after 9-11. Um, to, to, for full disclosure, uh, many people think I wrote the Patriot Act. I only wrote 50%, so I didn't write <laughs> the Patriot Act. Um, especially if you watch movies these days, I appear mysteriously in the background of movies uh, pulling Cheney's uh, strings, uh, which I did. No, I did not. <laughs> Never met Cheney uh, during the presidency of President Bush. And then the third one was uh, these kinds of wars, anti-terrorism wars, insurgency wars like Iraq and Afghanistan, which are not clear to me are wars for democracy. I mean, we were attacked on 9-11. You could say Afghanistan is a war of self-defense. I mean, I don't think we are going to Iraq to spread democracy. I think that's sort of an ad hoc justification that uh, Condoleezza Rice and John Rumsfeld and um, Colin Powell and President Bush sort of came up with. I think we really did go there for national security reasons. But put it aside, assume those are wars for democracy. Did those wars really produce a lowering of civil liberties at home? You know, Professor Desch's complaints about are really about the civil liberties of the people we're fighting against not about those um, at home. So take the administrative state. Yes, I agree, if there is a broader threat to liberty, it is the expansion of the administrative state. We've kind of grown accustomed to it. It's quite inconsistent with the founder's original design. But World War I and World War II didn't create the administrative state. The Great Depression created the administrative state. Right? World War I did create something like it, and then right after World War I is over, it's gone. Right? So it completely eliminated. The administrative state and the New Deal come into existence before World War II. World War II might have accelerated it somewhat, but it's not, I don't think it's war is responsible for the administrative state, but I will agree that administrative state is probably the broader threat to liberty we have today. Uh, the Patriot Act, again, I think a lot of things in the Patriot Act you could say are worries to have about civil liberties. I would think the greater threat, which I think people associate with the Patriot Act, don't have anything to do with what's going on domestically. Like a lot of people think Guantanamo Bay is in the Patriot Act. It's not, right? Patriot is mostly about domestic surveillance under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. I thought he was gonna defend President Trump because if anyone has this theory, it would be President Trump arguing that this Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which was designed and I worked on it to increase the electronic surveillance of terrorists, <clears throat> has actually been turned on a presidential campaign. I think that's astounding and I never thought that would happen. Actually, that, that would be a great te uh, argument for... And you think it happens? I, I kind of think it did, based on what we're seeing in public. But you didn't mention it, so you can't use it. I'm using it. <laughs> it's such a target-rich <laughs> environment, John. I can't mention everything. <laughs> Make it a fair fight. <laughs> so I would say, you know, to all of us, do we, do we have real threats to liberty <clears throat> worries? But yes, we should. Do they have to do with war? I would say not. I share his concern about our losses of privacy in this new electronic age. On the other hand, it also increases all of your civil liberties. I mean, we're also old enough to remember there used to be three TV channels and newspapers controlled all the opinion in the country. All of you now can, some of you are probably doing it right now about this ridiculous speaker, tweeting out your First Amendment rights about what you see and witness all around you. There, I think we're living in an unbelievable explosion in speech and <clears throat> rights of a kind we haven't seen in our country in history. The countervailing worry about privacy, I think you really ought to associate with Google and Facebook. The companies who are private actors, not the government, if there are people who are surveilling everything you're doing on the internet and accumulating all your data, it's the people who want to buy and sell <laughs> in our country, not the government. So uh, let me, am I up? Is, oh, I have more, oh good, I got a lot more stuff, no. <laughs> um, let me uh, turn lastly uh, for the undergraduates to what Professor Desch started with. I, uh, this is wonderful. I never get the chance to talk about the Peloponnesian War. Uh, at Berkeley, they would never let me teach a class involving the Peloponnesian War. So it's my only chance to talk about it. So it's a, it's a charming parallel. You know, are we living in uh, the Cid uh, a, a th sort of Thucydides moment? Um, there's a guy, Graham Allison at Harvard, wrote this book just out, claiming we are in the Thucydides trap right now. Does the analogy really hold up? Are we really Athens? By the way, if we had to pick a side, wouldn't you rather be Athens? Or would you rather 
be Sparta? Would you rather, again, live on top of a slave empire with, <coughs> totally designed for the militarization of society, which is Sparta and the garrison state? And we actually used to think Sparta was a Soviet Union. Or would you rather be in the free, democratic, chaotic, capitalist, entrepreneurial Athens, which great us gave us political. If it weren't for Athens, you wouldn't have a job. Munyas wouldn't have a job. I'd still be around. They created political science, right? They created political theory. They, we, our concepts of art, architecture, literature, right, theory, all come from those, those terrible, terrible Athenians, right? Wouldn't you rather be the Athenians? But is, was the Soviet Union really Persia? And then I guess under your account, the Spartans now would be the Chinese, right? And there is this kind of weird, I, and I'll link close with this, this weird worry amongst our national security community that seems to be very much like what we thought at the beginning of the Cold War with the Soviets. Oh, those Chinese, they're so better organized than us. They think so much more strategically than us. We're never going to be able to defeat them. Well, how'd that turn out for the Russians, right? Second, I think we often... Uh, project our worries under the, on the other countries. I mean, if it were true, why are there so many Chinese students in our universities? Why do so many Chinese want to move here? Why do 50% of the Chinese elite actually want to move to the United States or Canada, right, if it's such a great country? Right, so I, I think China has a lot of problems. What I would say is, uh, of course, I'm not going to argue like Athens and Sparta, <laughs> we should launch a, you know, an attack on China. But in the, Pel in the Peloponnesian War, if I remember uh, the Greek right, the Spartans were the ones who launched the attack on Athens, right? Like they thought Athens, remember, the, the Sparta was the hegemon hegemonic, hegemonic power. I still don't know the Greek, but I had to read it. The hegemonic power. Athens was the rising power, and the Spartans were worried that Athens was going to take over, and they struck them, right? I think it's very different. We're not going to launch a preventative attack on Sparta. I don't think we're going to reduce our civil liberties at home out of worry of China. I think the best thing we can do, and I hope we do it, is actually to pursue our own course of uh, you know, economic freedom, individual liberty, and a, a society that they can't understand and handle, which is you know, the unique American experience. And I bet that's what's going to allow us uh, to prevail, and that we won't have to make any deprivation of civil liberties in the struggle that's coming before us. So again, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, Notre Dame. I've had a wonderful uh, experience. I really enjoyed the hotel. It's the first time I think I've slept under a crucifix in a long time. <laughs> um, good for you guys. Um, and I really, I really enjoy the possibility to debate uh, Professor Desch and to participate in your uh, programs. Thank you very much. I got a little holy water here, and I'm going to sprinkle it on you and read the Roman rite. I'm trying to figure out what you do. Per Professor Yu was uh, kind enough to uh, give you a description of a uh, political scientist, so allow me to return the favor and uh, describe a lawyer. Mm. Uh, oh, that's, a lawyer that's, low. Is that's a low blow. <laughs> A lawyer is uh, someone who tells stories or spins to help their clients. John Yu is a brilliant lawyer on behalf uh, of the neoconservatives and indeed the bipartisan foreign policy establishment for the last 25 years, which in different ways has been committed to the same thing, which is a uh, hyperactive uh, American foreign policy. Political scientists were a little bit more systematic. Facts and logic uh, matter to us. Um, and uh, I also, one of my favorite radio shows, uh, everybody uh, on this side is too young to remember Paul Harvey, but there are a bunch of people on the other side of the room. And Paul Harvey was the uh, original talk radio guy from the Great Plains who always gave us the rest of the story. So I'm going to give what I think is the rest of the story. Uh, Professor Yu has this just-so story about how war, uh, maybe in the immediate exigency of the war, might result in the growth of the state and the restriction of civil liberties, but then when the war is over, the troops come marching home and all sorts of uh, good things happen. Um, and some good things happen. I would say uh, that a big step 
uh, toward the racial, full racial integration of African Americans began uh, in World War II. Um, and so, you know, that is uh, certainly uh, part of the story. But if you look at the data, the growth of the administrative state, and I can, uh, not to cite my own work, but uh, I had an article in International Organization in 1995 that had empirical data on the size uh, of the uh, state relative uh, to the total economy from 1800 through then 1995. Uh, and you saw what's been well documented by other scholars, a decided ratchet effect after wars. It's not the case that uh, war, uh, when the troops come home uh, and we demobilize, uh, that the uh, nanny state goes back to wherever Mary Poppins came from. Secondly, World War II was a war for democracy. John, I can't believe this. Uh, first of all, uh, who was our main ally? In fact, who was the country that really defeated Nazi Germany? I'm having trouble remembering it, but it's in the East. Uh, it was a country ruled by a one-party dictatorship that was uh, probably up there with Adolf Hitler in terms of mass uh, genocidal mass murder. Maybe not genocidal, because the Soviets and Uncle Joe Stalin were not killing people uh, based on race. They were killing them based on politics. World War II was a war of realpolitik. Um, and it was a right war. Uh, yeah, I think we had to fight it. But to put uh, this rosy patina of a war for uh, democracy uh, on that uh, seems to me to, uh, to be uh, a stretch. OK. Um, a lot of people who are critical uh, of my position that the United States uh, has been too active uh, abroad militarily in recent years will make an argument akin to the argument that John made, which is, look, uh, Uncle Sam, uh, after sitting out uh, two periods before major wars, finally put his big boy boots on. Uh, and got committed to maintaining uh, stability in Europe and did it uh, by uh, democratizing uh, Europe. It's an argument. Uh, but there are also lots of other reasons uh, why there was stability in Europe, particularly after World War II. How about the fact that there were two great powers that attracted basically uh, all the major states in the region and forced them to take side uh, with each other. It certainly was a balance of power. Secondly, the big difference uh, between uh, the interwar period and the early post-World War II period was the nuclear revolution. The nuclear revolution had nothing uh, to do uh, with democracy. So, as Paul Harvey says, there's the rest of the story. Now, I want to make one other point. Uh, John says that uh, our democracy is every bit as vibrant uh, and robust today uh, as it's ever been. You ought to call it Freedom House and ask them why they downgraded their characterization of American democracy from full to flawed um, in recent years. And the answer, of course, will be uh, the election of Donald Trump, probably. Now, what John wants to do is insinuate that somehow Trump is the candidate uh, of the Mike Deshes of the world uh, and the realists. Uh, and I know for a lot of uh, the people on the other side of the barricades, Trump uh, is anathema. No neocon, or very few neocons, except for John Bolton, uh, were you know, willing to uh, work for him. But I think that ignores the fact that the policies uh, that the party of war in our country have pushed, particularly since 9-11, have done a lot to make the American public cynical uh, about the establishment um, and set the stage uh, for the election of someone uh, like Donald Trump. Now again, there were lots of reasons uh, that Trump won the election. Uh, and certainly foreign policy uh, is never you know, one of the top two or three, but I don't think that you can deny uh, that this was part of uh, the general sense that the way we have done business for the last quarter of a century 
uh, was uh, deeply problematic. So what's my position? Um, John quoted uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton. That's fine. Uh, I'm going to quote somebody else. I'm going to quote John Quincy Adams, who gave a famous speech on July 4th of 1824. And I quote, Whenever or wherever the standard of freedom and independence has been or shall be unfurled, there will America's heart, her benedictions, and her prayers be. But she does not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. She is the well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all. She's the champion and vindicator only of her own. She will commend the general cause by the continence of her voice and the benignant sympathy of her example. She well knows that by once enlist enlisting under other banners than her own, were the, even the banners of foreign independence, she would involve herself beyond the power of extrication and all the wars of interest and intrigue of individual avarice, envy, and ambition, which assume the colors and usurp the standard of freedom. Friends, I'm speaking in, in favor of the resolution by channeling John Quincy Adams to you today. Thank you. We, we have about 20 minutes uh, for a conversation, and uh, let, me, let me start um, by asking Professor Yu to maybe respond to uh, Professor Desch's last point. What, what about the um, demoralization, uh, I think someone argued the, the increased polarization of our politics, not because we lost uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq, but we didn't clearly win. Uh, and uh, as a great danger, that war, I mean, that's one thing to wage war. The conversation sort of presumed that we'd win war. Uh, a great danger of waging war is that you don't win, and what that does to our politics. Uh, maybe just to respond uh, briefly to that last point, and then we'll turn it over to questions. So first, I, I just want to uh, agree with Professor Desch and his mischaracterization of lawyers. We are spinners of lies and webs of deceit, but only when we're paid. <laughs> uh, so if you were to pay me $1,000 an hour, I will be happy to represent a client and twist Professor Desch's arguments against him, which would not be too hard for him. <laughs> but it's, I'm not here for that purpose. <laughs> um, let me take this last point, you know, this attack of, of the nature of our democracy today, and Trump, and uh, war. So first thing, do you think that the election of Trump, I'm not sure whether it represents an increase or decrease in individual liberty at home. It's not the Freedom House's definition of democracy. Right? It is, do we think civil liberties are rising or falling uh, today? I think that's a very difficult counterfactual to claim if there had been no wars of the kinds we've been talking about. Somehow there'd be greater individual liberties than there are now. When we, I think, also are living in a period of greater individual liberty now than we were 50 years ago, 40 years ago, or even 30 years ago. Right? That's just, I just think it's very hard to, uh, to prove one way or the other. Uh, second, um, does the election of uh, Trump mean anything in this debate? I mean, who, if, you were, if you had Trump here, and I, I wouldn't want him, but if he were here, whose side do you think he would agree with more? I mean, who, who actually says, I do want to pull troops away from all these places around the world. I do want to get us out of these wars. Right? It's interesting to me that right, this, you know, the, the person who would, might be closest, I'm not saying Michael voted for him or that his uh, school thought is like the pro-Trump. I'm just saying Trump would probably agree with him more than my vision, which is probably like the, I would say, establishment, which is probably more uh, the conventional view that Trump campaigned against. Right? So if there is a person that you associate with Right. Reducing individual liberties or attacking democracy. He happens to be attached to the foreign policy view and the view of democracy spreading wars that Professor uh, Desch put forth. And then this last, uh, this last point about, uh, that you asked me to talk about, this um, idea that the United States doesn't go forth you know, looking for monsters to destroy. We're going to build a perfect democracy here and we'll be an image to the rest of the world. And aren't we failing at that? Our democracies and uh, bad shape. Again, I'm not sure how you decide whether our democracy is in worse shape or a better shape. You might just disagree with the outcome that democracy produced. You may be like Trump, you don't like Trump. That's the outcome our democracy uh, produced. But the, I think the one problem with John Quincy Adams' quote is he lived in a world where there were two vast oceans that we could hide behind. 
There were no natural competitors or rivals in the Western Hemisphere. There was no modern technology where a country could fire missiles at us, drop bombs on us from a distance. Unfortunately, I mean, I wish the world wasn't like this. The monsters are going to come here if we don't do anything about it. We can't withdraw to a fortress America anymore and pretend let the rest of the world just have at it. Because as we learned in World War II, eventually that's going to threaten us even in the Western Hemisphere. And so I just think, like it or not, we have to play a more active uh, role in the world, even if we didn't wish we have to, because of the nature of modern military technology. Uh, Michael mentioned <coughs> nuclear weapons, I think, changes the calculus of whether we can wait behind the oceans or whether we have to take a more proactive view in order to stop people from being able to attack us. That will produce mistakes. And one thing I would say is I don't see how that produces the harm to individual liberties. Whichever strategy you presume, you, we can have a theory about it, but I don't see the proof that actually that has happened. Okay, uh, we have a tradition in the program is that we always uh, invite our undergraduate students to ask the first question. So any undergraduates uh, with a question? Uh, Nick, stand up and I'll repeat the question with the microphone, but stand up and tell us who you are and ask your question. I am Nicholas. Uh, I'm a sophomore fellow of the Tocqueville program. Uh, and I'm also from Venezuela originally. So yesterday was a big day for us as President Trump officially delegitimized Maduro's government. Um, the question I think this is mostly for Professor Desch. You mentioned that uh, attempts to kind of nation build um, in whatever degree should really only be attempted in certain, certain circumstances. Like in Germany and Japan, states that have been really completely destroyed through war or whatever the cause. I think Venezuela right now with the you know, million percent inflation, huge immigration rate might be approaching that kind of a state. Um, not to mention, I guess, the geopolitical uh, ties it has with uh, Russia, China, North Korea, and the geographic closest to the U.S. What do you think would be the correct approach uh, from the U.S. with regards to Venezuela? Look, the situation in Venezuela... Can I just briefly repeat oh, the please, question? Sorry. The, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. go, go ahead if you want to say. So the question was about Venezuela and what a prudent policy might be uh, regarding uh, the current affairs. Yeah, and the situation in Venezuela is tragic, and it has been tragic for almost 20 years. And in previous periods in Venezuelan history, uh, it's also been bad. Um, and I think to you know recognize that uh, is one thing. But again, to commit the United States to being able to say, this is a terrible thing that's happening, that somehow we can fix it, is opening up Pandora's box. Um, and it's not surprising to me when people in the left who believe uh, that social engineering works domestically, so it could work uh, abroad as well. I don't want to say anything with our friends, the Keo School, who are committed uh, to uh, a certain form of uh, global social engineering. But when, when people who are more conservative and who are rightly skeptical uh, about uh, the conceit uh, of central planning, uh, rebuilding, or in some cases establishing for the first time order and democracy where it's never been, I start scratching my head and saying, what's going on? Uh, this is a matter, it seems to me, uh, of humility. Um, and not humility that's self-flagellation of the United States, because I think we've basically been, like Athens, uh, a great country, and one with many positive characteristics. But just because we're a great country, maybe the most powerful country the world has seen since Rome, there are limits to what we can do. And we've seen those limits recently in Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, in Libya, and I would argue uh, in Syria as well. So the laundry list of places where we've tried and failed uh, is longer than my arm. We Catholics uh, understand that the road to hell is paved with good intentions often. And I think that's going to be what we're going to put on Uncle Sam's gravestone uh, at the end of this century. I would have thought there's, Venezuela would not just be a democracy promoting thing, but there was this thing called the Monroe Doctrine. And the idea was the United States should try to protect the Western Hemisphere from outside influence. That's just in our national interest. I also think it's good for the countries in the Western Hemisphere, too. But and this is the policy announced after the Latin American countries started to become independent. 
And I would have thought, even a realist would say, well, we see Russian, Chinese, Cuban influences. Everyone's propping up Maduro. The last thing we should want is one of the most oil-rich countries in the Western Hemisphere, and a, a significant country in the Western Hemisphere, become a client state for the Chinese and the Russians. So I would think just out of our national interest, there might be a reason. Now, I'm not saying we have to send troops in, but I would say we should not do this hands-off out of doing nothing. I think we should do as much as we can to yeah, accelerate Maduro's exit and put in a, and maybe we would fail at encouraging a democratic regime, but I think that's better than the alternative. Yeah, John, I think though that you're uh, posing a false dichotomy. Uh, that uh, it's either you know you you stand completely hands off or you take completely uh, try to uh, micromanage the situation. I think that there are uh, you know steps in between it. One one of the big steps that uh, um, you know in recent years uh, the United States has basically given up on diplomacy. Uh, basically, our diplomacy has been run. Uh, out of the Pentagon, not out of Foggy Bottom. And that's not because there was a military coup and the soldiers uh, took control of the state. It was because uh, we have, for a variety of reasons, been inclined uh, to reach for the 16-pound ball-peen hammer to fix every problem uh, that comes up. And we have, we have undervalued uh, diplomacy. We've undervalued uh, economic straight, statecraft. And we've also undervalued uh, moral suasion. Now, I'm an old Latin Americanist, uh, and I know Latin American history pretty well. And you tell me uh, that the Soviets and the Chinese have established a beachhead in Caracas. I didn't read the New York Times this morning, so maybe I missed something. Uh, but I don't see I, that. I never read the New York Times. Yeah, <laughs> or even the Wall Street Journal. Um, but the, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, we tried to micromanage the situation in Cuba between the fall of Fulgencio Batista in 1959 um, and uh, the Bay of Pigs in April of 1961. Once bitten, twice shy. Um, that's a limit uh, to the uh, even great power of the United States. Okay, let's, get, let's get another uh, question. Oh, please, stand up. stand up so we can hear you. Tell us who you are. Um, hello, my name is Anna. I am a sociology graduate student, and I come from Moldova, one of the Soviet countries, where I used to work for the U.S. Embassy, so I will pick up the uh, diplomacy argument here. And I would say that I was surprised that although we were talking about promoting democracy, everything was centered around war, as if that is the only way to actually promote democracy. Because uh, for a democracy to operate well, we need people who think critically, who make their choices not based on fear or bigotry or uh, who are led into their decisions. So my question here is, to what extent wars help that, not only in the countries where war is waged, helping people actually become members of a democratic society, but how that also reflects on US <coughs> citizens who are, are taught to believe that there are all of these enemy countries around there and there are all of these people who are undesirable people and countries. Because democracy is not just about individuals or, or civil rights. So thinking of it more in this indeed. So the question generally is on uh, war and democratic character and what does uh, waging war, or I suppose failing to wage war, do to our character, not only the character of the people we wage war on, but on us? Why don't you take the first cut, John? I, I, so um, I'm not sure if, uh, what I can add, but I'll, let me try to address it. So I, I, I take it you're um, one of the assumptions you're making, and I think that you share with Professor Desch, is that war somehow changes the character of the people uh, and has a negative effect on the people, so then it pro and or, not and or, and therefore produces a negative effect on the democracy and civil liberties. And and then I think the second part of the question you were saying, and so look at the way we're treating immigrants to the United States. You see that in this argument about us versus them, let's put up a border wall, <coughs> and so on. So, um, you know, the debate topic itself is about civil liberties in the U.S., and it's based on this idea that we are a nation state and we are primarily debating what's the effect of war on civil liberties here. 
Um, not about, and I was trying to make this point here, we're not arguing about how does war affect the people we're fighting against. Uh, you know, for good or ill, when we fight war, we are trying to deprive, you know, the enemy of their civil liberties. Right? Uh, we, we don't care about their civil liberties during wartime. And so, uh, and that's the object of war, is to kill the members of the enemy armed forces, which is the greatest deprivation of civil liberties there is. Um, the, uh, so that, I, I mean, I just, I, you know, that's not part of our debate topic. Whether it produces this negative effect on us. So uh, it's undeniable, it does certainly concentrate it in our armed forces. Is it producing a greater sort of social corrosion, a cynicism in our politics? Uh, that I'm not so sure about. I mean, you, I would, I'd be willing to concede maybe our politics today is more cynical than it was in Reagan's day in the 1980s. It's hard, I think, to say that Iraq and Afghanistan produced that cynicism. A lot of other things have gone on in politics, too. It could be very, very well the case that if we'd never fought the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, we'd still have this level of cynicism. We still have this attitude towards immigrants. You know, there are people who say a lot of this has to do with the change of the economy, not war at all, right? It has to do with the loss of our manufacturing base, the rise of China and those cost producers. A lot of people, particularly in this region of the country, in the Midwest, were thrown out of work in good manufacturing jobs and had to move to service jobs. And that has uh, people on both the right and left in our politics have taken advantage of that to uh, appeal to a sort of populist element to pull out of trade agreements and uh, put up border walls. That's not about Iraq and Afghanistan at all. If this is because of China and the changes to the world economy, that would have happened anyway. So I don't, I, I just don't see, I don't think there's the connection, or if there is, it's extremely difficult to prove. So, um, Professor Yu wants to uh, force me into defending Sparta, which I won't do. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm an Athenian, and oh. I care about... Can I get that in writing? Sure. <laughs> P-E-R-I-C-L-E-S, that's my name, <laughs> And, and I think that um, the, the tragedy uh, of Athens, and I think the tragedy of the United States, is that many of our uh, most serious problems uh, are not the Harold Glasswell garrison state problem, but rather they're inextricably linked with the dynamics uh, of American democracy itself. Let me give you two examples. One is the uh, end of conscription and the rise of the all-volunteer uh, army. Professor Yu didn't mention this, but you know you could celebrate this as an example uh, of uh, greater liberty um, in modern America. I look at it, though, from a Periclean perspective, and I ask myself, uh, how have we been able to fight, uh, basically, a series of unending wars uh, that have really not accomplished very much uh, over the past quarter of a century. And the answer, of course, is we have an all-volunteer army that's made up of a very small cross-section uh, of our society. So for most of us, fortunately, uh, this is the case is better here at Notre Dame, but I think for most American elites, uh, we don't have kids who are in the military. We don't even really know people uh, who are serving. So the decision to send men and women down range is a decision that's made in the abstract and it makes it easy to fight wars for democracy or other highfalutin uh, sorts of things. Second thing is uh, the deficit spending or the Overseas Contingency Operation Fund which is uh, the credit card that we put our uh, recent wars on. I mean we love this, or I love it. Uh, because uh, I'm going to be dead when the bill comes due. I'm not going to have to pay it. Um, but this is uh, something that, uh, you know, the, that, that, that it's easy to sell the public on because the young people don't realize that they've been had and the old folks like me won't be around uh, for uh, the uh, bill to come due. Um, and so this is an example uh, of the corrosion of our political system, not the corrosion uh, of the man on horseback, but rather the corrosion of uh, we're going to tell people they can have their cake and eat it too, and it's going to lead us uh, to hell. One small point about the budget deficits. Uh, I mean, I take your point. Uh, the people in this room, the young students, are going to have to pay an enormous bill because of all the deficit spending. I would just say that my point would be it's not caused by war. 
Okay, so our, uh, you know, our military spending used to be for many years larger than the rest of the world combined. It was very, so in the hundreds of 300, two, 300 billion dollars. It seems like a large figure. But I think most people would agree that the huge budget deficit is not being produced by military spending, which as a percentage of total GDP used to be much higher in the Cold War. It used to be double or sometimes triple what it is now. It's the growth entitlement programs, Social Security, right, Medicare, Medicaid. Those are what are blowing a hole through our spending. That's what you're going to be paying for 20, 30 years from now. But that's not the product of war, unless you take the large argument that somehow war has produced the welfare entitlement state. But I think that comes about in the New Deal before we go into World War II, and entitlement spending is just this uh, you know, machine that goes of itself. But war is not the thing that's causing our bills to go up. The, the largest fraction of the discretionary federal budget is the yes. Department of Defense. Um, and you're absolutely right. Um, uh, you know, entitlements are non-discretionary, and they're a big problem in and of itself. But you can't, uh, you know, can't get away from war in this. We're, we're just about out of time, uh, but I want to follow up on something that you both alluded to, which was the FISA and the, poss the possibility of our own intelligence services uh, monitoring, dropping in on a presidential campaign. Uh, one, what, was I right in uh, understanding you right that you think that might have happened? And if that did happen, uh, since our conversation is on civil liberties, how alarmed should we be? And then one follow-up question after that. So uh, I won't take too long, but the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act for those of you who have studied it closely, I hope most of you have not, um, is a bill that was passed after Watergate. So one of the right, intrusions on civil liberties that took place under the Nixon years was Nixon was basically using the CIA and the FBI to wiretap, build files on people without any authorization from Congress or the courts. <coughs> so after that, this FISA law was passed. Um, and uh, it's cr it creates a special court. You go to that court, you say, we have a foreign intelligence target we want to surveil. It's given out as a warrant that does not meet normal constitutional requirements. You don't have to prove this, the person did it, made, committed a crime, which is what a normal warrant requires under the Fourth Amendment. So uh, I've practiced before the FISA court after 9-11. It is, uh, I'm uh, not disclosing any secrets, it's contained in a vault uh, at the top fifth floor of the Justice Department, which is a stupid place to put a vault because it's very heavy. And if they were attacked, the vault would just fall right down into the basement of the building and everyone would die. <laughs> Maybe that's the general idea. <laughs> You practice for is a classified hearing. The person who speaks field never even knows about it and can, cannot is not allowed to know about the violation of classification. So when we changed FISA after 9/11 to make it easier to follow terrorists around the country, uh, there were people who argued. Civil libertarians said this is, could be potentially abused to be used against Americans. And I thought, I personally, I was, I thought that was extremely unlikely. And I, I'm first admit, I, from what I've seen so far, I, I've turned out to be wrong. I, I'm actually quite shocked by uh, the Justice Department's granting a FISA warrant to surveil an, uh, an in-progress presidential campaign. I mean, that's, that's like the prototypical example for what FISA was passed to stop. So I, I, I would, that's why I thought we were going to talk about during the debate was I, I'm willing to concede that did happen. That is a reduction of civil liberties. It's something to be worried about. I, I'm as a Justice Department official who worked on those bills I, and the practice. Where I, I, I can't believe that we did it. To clarify, yeah. do we know that we did it? or? Well, the FISA warrants were granted, the surveillance occurred, the argument, I mean, there was a surveillance of the presidential campaign's uh, officials. The, this is where the Steele dossier comes in, is whether there was made up grounds to get it or whether there were valid grounds to get it. But the warrant was granted and there was wiretapping of, presidential, of a presidential campaign. Just very quickly to, to pick up on this, I have a good friend who's a Notre Dame alum and a trial lawyer, does pro bono work on terrorism, including defending Guantanamo detainees. And I told him I was going to be uh, debating you. And he said, he had a question for you. He said that the uh, rumor on the street is that the Federal Bureau of Investigation is pushing a modification of the uh, FISA uh, Act that would make it uh, applicable domestically, and I think in certain classes uh, of uh, criminal proceedings. 
Um, and he said, you should ask Professor uh, Yu uh, if that makes him nervous. I think, I'm guessing, uh, based on the gestalt of your comments uh, previously, uh, that it would make you nervous. Well, let me, let me first say, if there are any other Notre Dame alums who want to call and show, or I'll just answer questions. I'm happy to start <laughs> after this debate is over. I'll answer any questions you want. Just, uh, I don't know how to text them in. Um, so uh, this is a really interesting question, because there were people in Congress right after 9-11 who wanted to do that. They wanted to say, this FISA system with a lower requirement to get warrants, broader surveillance powers, should be used not just against foreign terrorists, but we should expand its use within the United States, too. I uh, actually argue you couldn't do that because I think the Supreme Court would not allow it. And so I, I don't think that, even if the FBI got the law changed, which Congress would have to pass, I think the courts would not allow the use of FISA against uh, US, uh, criminal conduct in the US. It's the only reason you get this right to have this easier surveillance power is because you're trying to catch foreign terrorists or spies, but not against. The hard question, and this is the, the constitutional question the courts have to face is, what happens when it's Americans who sign up with the enemy and are saying, I'm not doing anything, you're using these powers that the government needs for national security against an American citizen, and I should just get a normal criminal trial. That's, I don't think the Supreme Court's going to change. Well, one last thing, if anything, oh, it's just said this during the civil liberties part. If anything, the Supreme Court has actually been expanding civil liberties against electronic surveillance, uh, quite a contra to the Obama and, and Trump and Bush administration. So uh, if you look at the Supreme Court cases, things like GPS trackers have been struck down. Uh, uh, Finding your location based on the location of your cell phone movements has been struck down. So actually in this period, the Supreme Court is one of the branches of the government, has been actually expanding our civil liberties in this new age. So I don't think they would ever allow a FISA act like that based on their track record. You know, not only do we need a bigger room, we needed more time. Uh, I thank uh, especially Professor Yu, who traveled all the way from California, had a very di difficult day of travel for joining us, and my good friend and colleague, uh, Mike Dash, for a wonderful conversation. Thank you.